Uh, thank you for attending today's event uh, on tech, tech talent and uh, the, the U.S. economy. Uh, we're delighted to welcome both those of you in the room and our online viewers uh, viewing at csas.org. Uh, for those of you here and uh, online, following this event, about 48 hours or so after we con conclude today, the webcast will be posted at csas.org and available on the events page for this event. CSAS is pleased to present this uh, event in partnership with the Pennsylvania State University's School SMEAL College of Business. Uh, we, we are delighted with this partnership and have learned a lot all the, already and, and look forward to continuing our work with, uh, with the SMEAL uh, College uh, over, over the next uh, weeks and months. To add his welcome and uh, introduce today's topic, I'm pleased to introduce Dean Charles Whiteman of the SMEAL College. Dean Whiteman. Well, welcome uh, to the uh, session on 21st century tech talent and the American economic edge. Uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Gadar and the Center for Global Business Studies uh, for coming up with the topic and uh, CSIS uh, for uh, uh, holding this uh, wonderful event. Uh, my name is Chuck Whiteman. I'm the John and Becky Surma Dean of the Smeal College of Business. Uh, and I want to say that STEM has been on my mind a lot recently. Um, a few years ago, we re-articulated the strategic plan of the Smeal College of Business, and one of the things that we wanted to do was to increase our global presence uh, and our welcoming nature uh, in the Smeal College. Uh, and we know that with the increasing internationalization of the student body, uh, brings some challenges. Uh, and one of them was pointed out to me by my placement director, who said, you know, this other part of the strategic plan where you said you want to get placement rates at graduation up uh, might be more challenging as our student body becomes ever more international. Uh, fortunately, this past spring, we did push our graduation rate, or sorry, our placement rate at graduation uh, up above 82 uh, percent. So we're very, uh, very pleased uh, by that. Uh, but it does still remain a challenge, and I was reminded uh, of that by a partner at one of the big four firms uh, who warned me a year and a half ago that it is going to become an increasing challenge, unless there's a change in federal policy, uh, for firms to take on the lottery uh, that is uh, the visa situation that we have in this country now. Uh, firms are finding it um, increasingly expensive to bring in uh, new employees who then 17 months or 29 months later lose the lottery and have to go uh, back home. Firms investing in those folks and then seeing them uh, have to leave uh, is a serious issue for, uh, for firms. So the issues that we're going to talk about today I think are very, very appropriate uh, for what we have going forward. Another reason I'm thinking about STEM a lot uh, is uh, we have, uh, over the last 18 months, worked very hard in the Smeal College to create a new one-year master's program, which is aimed at recent STEM graduates. The idea is take students uh, who are going to work probably in industry in STEM fields uh, that need a little bit of training up, to quote from Harry Potter, uh, in business. Uh, we did market research on this. Uh, the consultant's executive summary was a very simple statement. He said, I've never seen a program as popular as this one in my 20 years of doing this kind of work. We're very excited about it. Uh, we shopped it uh, to other STEM deans uh, at the University Park campus, and they were all delighted uh, that somebody else was thinking about the welfare of their students after they leave uh, Penn State. So. We're very excited about this program. Uh, we haven't done any uh, serious advertising of it yet. Uh, we already have multiple students accepted into the program. Uh, we have um, a major corporation got wind of what we were doing, asked with permission, of course, to see uh, resumes of some of the students accepted into the program. Uh, and they are in the process of hiring one of them now for a program that doesn't start until fall of 2017 internships over the holidays, next summer, 
pay the student's tuition during the course of the program and guarantee them a job on the other end. And oh, by the way, they want to help promote this program as a way of advertising to the world that they are interested in, in talent development for their own company. Uh, so uh, with that, I'm very eager to get the uh, conference underway and get to the substance uh, of the American economic edge and 21st century tech talent. Let's get on with it. Thank you, Dean Whiteman and Scott Miller. Um, it's a pleasure being here, and thank you very much for all coming. Um, there's two components to uh, our conference this morning. One is on the supply, and one is on the demand side. The first panel, it really looks at the demand for STEM, science, technology, engineering, and the difficulties that many of our companies have in recruiting uh, people to join. Uh, the unemployment rate in many of these companies are quite low, but yet they, they have difficulty getting the skills that they need to expand their operation. Um, I've worked with uh, Scott Miller on the first and second panel. The second panel really will look at um, how difficult it is becoming for highly skilled people to stay in the States. And um, the beginning of my study, we did a study on immigration, uh, was brought about because I was flying from Ohio out and I sat next to a gentleman um, who was getting his PhD from Stanford in um, fracking. And so I said, well, you must be really highly in demand. He said, well, actually, I can't get my H-1B visa and I'm moving to Australia. And so that sort of hit me. Uh, what are we doing in order to keep and maintain and enhance the capabilities that we have based on allowing immigrants to stay here? So these are the two panels. With that, um, I have a short video. And I think, I don't, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to do it. There we go. Thank you, Dan. If we could uh, press the first okay, the space, bar. The space bar. Thank you. <laughs> the demand for science and technology expertise is a global phenomenon. We are not meeting the requirements of the industry. STEM fields are expected to see increases ranging from 16% in mathematics to 62% in biomedical engineering. A number of industries are already facing serious skills gaps when it comes to STEM capabilities. 26 million U.S. jobs, 20% of all jobs, require a high level of knowledge in any one STEM field. And half of all STEM jobs are available to workers without a four-year college degree. Specifically, women, African Americans, and Hispanics pose the greatest challenge and also the greatest opportunity when it comes to STEM fields. And moving into the future, those are the very groups who will make up the majority of the workforce. How will we in the U.S. assure that our workforce has the science and technology capability to be competitive in the global environment? So with that brief introduction, I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Scott Miller, who will um, facilitate the first panel. Thank you. Thank you, FG. <clears throat> and uh, if we get the house lights, I can actually read my notes. <laughs> and, but uh, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, this morning, and I'm really excited about this topic. Now, if you appreciate irony, as a form of humor, you really can't beat American politics for the entertainment potential. Um, and uh, one of the areas of great irony I've noticed over the past several months is that many campaigns, many uh, elected officials uh, re have routinely uh, decried the loss of manufacturing jobs. Yet thousands, literally thousands of manufacturing jobs are, are unfilled across the United States. The U.S. Department of Labor reports that the number of open manufacturing jobs has been rising since 2009. You'd never know that from listening to the politicians. Um, and uh, frankly, is it now is at its highest level in 15 years. Now, so-called factory work has changed and evolved pretty dramatically, mostly due to technology, and now requires a very different set of skills than it did 40 years ago. 
Um, this panel is going to talk about what skills are required, and it's really, it, what we hope to do is redefine STEM. STEM is not so it is becoming a software engineer or a, uh, a biomedical researcher, but it's also about being a process control technician and having you know stable, good-paying jobs in advanced manufacturing. Uh, so this panel is going to uh, explore the, the sort of the contours of the challenge of recruiting and uh, hiring and retaining STEM employees. We're going to look at it at three levels. We're going to actually start at the firm level. Uh, with uh, Laura Kohler. Laura is Senior VP of Human Resources and Stewardship for the Kohler Company uh, in Kohler, Wisconsin. We'll look at it at a state level, a regional or state, and how the challenge, how states are dealing with this challenge. And we're grateful to have uh, Jim Boland, uh, Chairman of Jobs Ohio, uh, former uh, Vi Vice Chairman Emeritus Ernst & Young, uh, to talk about the programs and, and the challenges in the, in the state of Ohio. And then we'll look from the federal level, where David Cramner, Deputy Director of the Hollings Manufacturing Extension Partnership of the National uh, uh, Institute for Science Standards and Technology, uh, will we'll, uh, wrap up our, our panel. So with that, let me turn it over to Laura, and let's hear about the challenges you're facing. There Thank you. Go. Um, Color company, back towards me. All right, is that good? <laughs> All right, uh, Color Company is a 143-year-old company. We're a global manufacturing company with 55 manufacturing locations around the world, 34,000 people approximately, and approaching six billion in revenue. We have 12 manufacturing locations in the United States. Our headquarters uh, is in Kohler, Wisconsin, and I guess I, I, I want to talk about our demand, our demand for talent. Uh, and if we don't meet that demand for talent, we won't be able to grow in the United States. So currently, uh, we make everything from toilets to sinks to bathtubs, faucets, engines, generators. We have hotels and golf courses. Uh, and we also make fine furniture, mirrored cabinets. You might know us under the Kohler brand name. You might know, uh, know us in, uh, under the brand name Sterling. You might know us for Ansax Tile and Stone, Baker McGuire Furniture, Roburn Cabinetry, Callista Faucets, things like that. Uh, that's uh, really who we are. We've made 47 acquisitions around the world, uh, and um, we're really proud of the four groups of businesses we have. Now, going back to the United States, peeling back the onion to really what's happening here, uh, at the end of 2016, we're looking at 37 open engineering jobs in the United States. It takes us about 105 days to fill an engineering job. We are sitting, though, with those open jobs uh, that we've been unable to fill. We're sitting with supply chain and ops jobs of about 38 in the United States, those take about 85 days to fill. IT jobs, we only have six, but those take 100 days to fill. Uh, we have seven open design jobs, those take about 100 days to fill. And skilled trades, very, very tough to fill, and we have 13 of those. Uh, manufacturing, 72 openings in, across our 12 locations. That doesn't sound potentially like a lot to you, but actually uh, it, it is very difficult to move product through a facility when you have uh, consistent vacancies. So what does that mean for us? We then look at the unemployment rates in our counties where we have manufacturing. We're looking at 3.3% at our largest manufacturing location in, in Wisconsin, a 3.3% unemployment rate. Um, Sheridan, Arkansas, 3.5% unemployment. Brownwood, Texas, 4.5. Those are our largest manufacturing sites. So we're sitting on vacancies of STEM positions uh, in very low unemployment uh, counties. So what are we doing about that? Well, very quickly, we're putting more pressure on H-1B. We really need to bring in more uh, skilled talent. Um, we opened a tech center in Pune, India, frankly, to hire engineers. We are making more investments in our high schools in the counties where we live and work. Uh, we are working with local tech schools and creating apprenticeship programs. So we're, we're, we're actually taking the, you know, the mission to the streets to create our own talent pipeline. Uh, frankly, this problem is not going to be solved in the short term. Um, and we absolutely believe that in order to grow in the United States, we need a, more, a stronger pipeline of talent for STEM. Thank you, Laura. Before we move on to Jim, could you talk a little bit about 
the, those those manufacturing jobs. Mm -hmm. First, what is the content of the work? Right. What kind of skills are you requiring? And second, what what is high, what are the crop of high school students in the United States or in, in in where you operate facilities? What does it look like, and how how well are they matched? for what's required in your workplace? Right, so that's a great question. Um, the content of work is changing. Uh, obviously, more robotics, more technical requirements. Uh, but what's not happening is the high schools are not preparing students to take on uh, those kinds of careers. So what we're doing is actually going in, we just gave a $500,000 grant to two local high schools to improve their tech centers. Uh, and really start to talk about that manufacturing can be cool. It's not your grandfather's job anymore. And to start to get high school students excited about a career in manufacturing, it's not staying in one position doing something that's very manual now. It is working in, in cells. Uh, it is working in, in teams. It is job rotation. It is a, a career progression. Uh, that's what the youth today want to hear. And, um, and then we uh, then bring them into working apprenticeships and also uh, help them with uh, scholarships to the tech schools that will give them um, the skills that they need to be successful. Their parents actually want to hear that manufacturing careers can be uh, you know, a living wage, but a, a wage that they could raise a family on. So we also are working um, a PR campaign with parents as well to also convince them that manufacturing can be cool. I'm in the midst of raising a couple of millennials, and so this notion of, of something that sounds cool as a career really resonates right. <laughs> with I mean, the conversations I have at home. And, right. and it's, a, it's an interesting insight because, because in, in a lot of young people don't really, uh, their, their conception of, the fact, of, of a factory or of what goes on in manufacturing is like from a Charlie Chaplin movie exactly. or something like that. And, and so what can be done to bring sort of modern manufacturing to life? Because I think ultimately these are much more satisfying jobs than anybody thinks right. or believes. If you could talk about that, that'd be great. Well, I think we have to um, kind of go back and educate people about what's really going on on the manufacturing floors across this country. Um, I think we have to show pictures. We, we are doing things called My Kohler videos. We're taking snapshots of our younger employees and having them tell the story and putting that on our website. This is what it looks like uh, to work in Brownwood, Texas, in Kohler, Wisconsin, and Sheridan, Arkansas. You know, this is the kinds of things that you get to do every day. These are the kinds of people that you get to work with. So really just our, and that's called an employment value proposition. It's really helping people understand what really happens. Um, if we don't do that, Scott, then the old stories just continue on. Uh, we have to remake the story of manufacturing today. Thank you, Laura. Um, Jim Boland is the chairman of a fascinating program in the state of Ohio, uh, Jobs Ohio. Uh, first, the manufacturing in Ohio, uh, it, when you call Ohio the Rust Belt, it means you haven't been there for a while because there's a tremendous amount of advanced manufacturing going on in the state of Ohio. Uh, and Jim, Jim has been at the forefront of this. Uh, I would also note from his bio that uh, not only is, is he uh, uh, spent a long career at, at uh, one of, the, I guess, the final four accounting firms now, uh, but, uh, but is uh, familiar with skilled talent uh, in his role with the Cleveland Cavaliers, uh, who last I checked were NBA champions. That's right. <laughs> Congratulations. No thanks to me, though. <laughs> thanks, Jim. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about a unique uh, development company called Jobs Ohio. Uh, it's been in existence about five years. Uh, Governor Kasich uh, won the uh, governorship in Ohio in uh, J uh, January of 2011. His first bill he passed was outsourcing the uh, state's development office into an independent uh, 501c4 called Jobs Ohio. Uh, we also developed a 503 uh, company called uh, Jobs Ohio Beverage. And the mission of Jobs Ohio is, is basically two things, jobs creation and uh, capital investment. And uh, also to work at the speed of business because the uh, former development department in the state, you know, they might answer your phone call and get back to you in, you know, two, three weeks later. It took a year, year and a half to get things done. And when you're in that kind of an environment, companies just aren't going to work with you. So we, we took, took over the business, and the first thing we did, well, as a matter of fact, we started, we had nine directors, eight independent directors, and uh, one uh, 
management person who's the uh, uh, president and chief investment officer. But we went out with a billion six bond offering uh, uh, supported by the uh, revenues of the liquor. And, and Ohio is a uh, state that controls all the liquor. So we, we took that over. There are about 1,270 some outlets from the major uh, retail, uh, major uh, grocery stores down to mom and pops. Uh, all of them have different systems. Inventory was a nightmare, still is. We're working with uh, Microsoft to get the systems in place. But from that, we, we started, a, we got the money, we defeased about a billion three of state of Ohio debt. Uh, bonds they had outstanding also took over some liabilities. They had to clean up sites that were contaminated from prior companies being there. So we had about 300 million bucks to, to start up Jobs Ohio. And again, for about six to nine months, we had more directors than we had employees. We only brought over about two or three people from the state development office. Uh, and we started to focus on nine industries. And I'll, I'll cover them here for you in a minute. Uh, but manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, uh, aerospace and aviation. You, you got Wright Patterson in Columbus or in uh, Dayton, which is a big operation and you got a NASA operation in Cleveland. Uh, financial services, logistics and distribution, food processing, uh, information technology, biohealth, uh, energy, and uh, petrochemicals. These nine uh, industries re uh, represent a big percentage of the gross domestic product in Ohio. So we didn't want to get involved in a lot of details. We wanted to have the key drivers of growth in Jobs Ohio, we focused on those. Each one of those businesses has a general manager who's had experience in the industry that they're, they, they're responsible for. This means they've been in a long time, they can walk in and talk to a CEO and communicate with a CEO on what their needs are and what have you. It's worked very, very well. Uh, the, uh, we also started a, a customized talent acquisition group and they focus only on our uh, uh, projects that we're working with. Companies, whether we bring companies in and traction or retention of companies in Cleveland. You know, and, and Kasich, when he first came in, first thing he did was have all the presidents of the community colleges in Ohio and the state universities come down to Columbus and talk to them about what they would be doing if they wanted to get any funds from the state of Ohio. And that would be to support the manufacturing companies or other companies that are on our uh, platform here for getting jobs, training people. And uh, he said, if you don't do it, you're not going to get any state funds. So that got their attention. And places like uh, Canton, where Temkin has, uh, has gone through some restructuring in the last couple of years, they have their community college focused directly with Temkin on training their people up for all the new technologies that the steel industry has. So that was a, that was a big deal. And the state colleges also have a, a great, they're great for companies that are coming in here because one of the key things a company looks for is what kind of universities do you have? How can we make sure we're getting the talent that we need? So that that's worked very well. Uh, we, we, in 2015, we had 330 projects we worked on. We resulted, it's about 80% 80, 80 of those were small and medium-sized company. We generated 24,000 new jobs in that period of time, 6.5 billion of capital investment, and we retained 54,000 jobs that people were gonna move operations someplace else, or that type of thing, where we were able to help the company work through whatever their issues were. Uh, we have six regional partners around the state, uh, Northeastern Ohio, Toledo, Dayton, Cincinnati, Columbus, and Appalachia, which is the eastern part of the United States, southeastern part of the United States, or of Ohio, that we also fund, and we, we fund them according to how they're performing. They're basically our sales force out in the communities. They know the companies in their communities, what their needs are, could be the, the growth association in these places. But there are a lot of different entities in these areas that are working with companies that need help. That's paid off tremendously for us because it's our sales force. 
Uh, the, the state had, I think, about 150, 200 people in their development office. We're at 75 and we'll probably cap out at about 80. And the talent we have there, you can feel the culture when you walk into Jobs Ohio's offices in Columbus. And it's amazing, CEOs come in there and they see all these things, all open space. It's not quite as nice as this place, but it's, <laughs> it's pretty close. Now, we don't have marble floors and that type of thing, but uh, that, that's been uh, very important for us. So it's, you know, it's, we have a lot of states now that are coming to Ohio to find out what we're doing. We're totally independent from the state. We do follow, uh, we have a big four accounting firm that does our audit. They also work with a state auditor every year on compliance and controls, which is very important to us because we're very focused on our governance. Uh, we do things we don't have to do as far as disclosures. The one thing we don't disclose are emails that we have from uh, potential clients or pe companies that are thinking of moving or bringing something in because a lot of times the CEO in a company knows what's going on, but his right-hand man may not know what's going on. A lot of time they're talking to us about bouncing ideas off before it becomes public. As soon as we sign a contract with a company, it's, in, uh, it's, it's on our website that, that month. Uh, we go way overboard on disclosure uh, for a nonprofit. But it's worked out well. Uh, it, it, our lease is 25 years with the state. Uh, and, and after 25 years, the state will have the option of continuing what we're doing or to bring it back in. And if they do, they'll bring it back in tax-free. I uh, won't have, uh, have a really wonderful operation. But it's been amazing to see the young people we have working in Jobs Ohio, the enthusiasm they have, the industry knowledge they have, and how they really can develop relationships that make a big difference for the state of Ohio. Thank you, Jim. Uh, could you talk a little bit about advanced manufacturing and particularly the way manufacturing facilities improve over time? Because that has an implication for both the talent that they're recruiting at, uh, at, at an entry level, but also how that you develop the skills for workers over the course of their career. Uh, how does Jobs Ohio uh, interact with that uh, we, we issue? We try to work with the companies, and FG's familiar with one of, one of the companies that's uh, really been on the forefront of this. Uh, it's a manufacturing company, uh, valves and fittings. Uh, they do a lot of internal training of their people, but they also work with a local community college as well as a, a local university, uh, particularly for engineers at the University Case Tech, which is uh, Case Western Reserve, but Case is the engineering piece of it. Mm -hmm. And they have very strong relationships there. They have apprentices that come in, uh, work while they're going to school. They also have never laid anybody off. They'll bring them part-time workers and they can adjust their uh, workforce depending on what the economy is. They're a global company. That's worked very well. We're finding that the uh, community colleges are a great resource for these companies too uh, because they will tailor programs specifically to the needs of the companies. And, and some of these things go over you know, a year or two or three years. So it's not just you know in for a day or in for, it's really training over a period of time. And you're seeing more and more companies now trying to get more up to speed on how they could continue to get their workforce because you know anybody that's coming into Ohio, they, you know they wanna know what the market is, the transportation out of there, they wanna know what the infrastructure is, they wanna know how the government is, they wanna know the colleges and universities that they have access to. That's a big deal because skilled workers are, no matter where you go, they're trying to find skilled workers. And uh, uh, we have a long way to go, but we've made some really s significant strides. Thank you, Jim. I'd like to turn now to uh, David Cranmer. Uh, David is a deputy director of the Hollings Manufacturing Extension Program at NIST. Uh, he's been with MEP uh, for over 20 years, 20, 23 years. Impressive run, and uh, and is uh, very involved in in a number of issues, uh, particularly the, this notion of business business to business marketing for smaller manufacturers and establishing uh, improved technology and standards. Uh, so, David, what are you seeing from a national level? Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate being able to be here. Um, I want to take a somewhat longer perspective and probably go back about 25 years, back in the days when I actually was a practicing ceramic engineer, mm. which I'm sure Kohler might we be able to those. use. He's <laughs> a retirement job for you. <laughs> yeah, if I need one of those, let's, let's not talk about that one right now. 
Um, the Hollings Manufacturing Extension Partnership, this is the obligatory commercial, has a physical presence in all 50 states and Puerto Rico. And our job, as set up 28 years ago by the Congress, is to help smaller manufacturers in the U.S. get and stay globally competitive, whatever that means. Um, it's a co-funded public-private partnership. The federal government only puts in about a third of the funding for the system. The rest comes from the states or from the companies that pay for the services that our, our consulting engineers provide in the field. Um, in a typical year, we serve about 30,000 clients, about 8,000 of whom will report real honest-to-God economic impact through an independent third-party survey. Um, for 2015, those companies reported $8 billion in new and retained sales, a billion two in cost savings, and about three billion in new investments by those clients, either in capital equipment or in training for their employees so that they can be more productive. Um, as Scott noted earlier, there have been huge changes in manufacturing. If you look at it just from the value added part of the equation, manufacturing looks pretty healthy. The value added of manufacturing shipments has gone up about 7% in the last couple of years, between 2007 and 2012. Uh, and about 60% of that total came from small manufacturers. Um, totally, in total, it's about $5.7 trillion right now, depending on which source you look at. If I go back to when I started at MEP, that number was $3.8 trillion. So there's a lot more going on. Unfortunately, in the same time period, the number of manufacturing establishments has decreased significantly. When I started, it was about 360,000. Today, it's closer to 290,000. Now, we lost some of those when the federal government, in its wisdom such as it is, changed from the standard industrial classification code system to the North American industrial classification system. But still, that's a huge increase, decrease. Um, employment in those same years probably went from about 16 and a half million in 1993 to 12 million today with a low point of about 11 and a half in 2010. So you can see we've started to add manufacturing jobs back, but the challenge as Laura pointed out, as Jim pointed out, is finding the skilled workers you need because the nature of that work has changed significantly. When we talk about the skills mismatch, part of that is because of new technologies. The degree of automation, robotics, computer controlled maintenance, specialty materials, all of those things have changed so that you need greater skills. At the same time, companies have gotten somewhat pickier about which kinds of employees they want. Mm -hmm. So rather than take somebody who's not quite the right fit, and provide training and experience to get them there. Far more companies now, especially smaller ones, would say, I'd rather hire somebody who can hit the ground running, and if I have to wait in order to find that right person, I'll do that. And part of the worry is, as a, the owner of a small company, by the time I've trained somebody, I've spent several tens of thousand dollars to get them to where they need to be, my competitor, could steal them for a relatively modest increase in salary. And that doesn't sit well with a lot of owners of small manufacturing companies. So the focus on STEM really is the key to this, and having more people, more prospective employees have STEM skills. It starts in kindergarten, if not before. It starts with tech spaces, with maker spaces, it starts as early as you can get them. And if you have not been to a maker space or a tech space, how many have been? I would highly recommend go visit one because that's where you will see what the future of manufacturing looks like. For those of you who are local, if you want to take a trip over to National Harbor, there's a place called Local Motors that is basically building one-off 
using 3D printed additive manufacturing technology to build vehicles that are actually street worthy. So those kinds of things, digital manufacturing, additive manufacturing, smart manufacturing, are all converging. And over the next three, four, five years, they will fundamentally change the nature of work. So the jobs that have been lost are not the ones that are going to be here in the future. So whether you are a student, whether you are an unemployed manufacturing person, you need to be able to upgrade your skill set to be able to do those kinds of jobs. Uh, for us, that starts with things like the next generation science standards that help set the stage in K through 12 system. Um, it starts with things like robotics competitions, and if you've seen those, those are an absolute hoot. They're a lot of fun to be part of. Um, and there are also things like Manufacturing Day. This is something that MEP started five years ago in an attempt to get more people exposed to modern day manufacturing, to see it's not the 1970s era job that <coughs> Penn State got for me as an undergraduate that was not the cleanest environment I've ever been in, but it was the nature of manufacturing in Pittsburgh in that era. Um, it's a very different environment. So we started Manufacturing Day with the idea that we could get students and others to go visit today's manufacturing facilities. So for 2016, October 7th was Manufacturing Day. We had over 3,000 events across the country. We know of at least one company in Kansas who uses that to recruit high school students because they'll bring them in to show them what they're doing and then go back to the teachers and say, who's your best? Because we want to hire them now. So it's a chance for both sides to see each other. That's been successful enough that the National Association of Manufacturers is going to be the lead organization okay. for Manufacturing Day 2017. And all 25 partners or however many national ones we've got will continue to be involved because it's way too important. And as I pointed out to a group of procurement technical assistance centers last week. Manufacturing is no less important today than it was the day before the election. It's a key part of the U.S. economy, and we need to support it appropriately and have the right people to be able to work in those jobs. And with that, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. And uh, terrific presentations by all the panelists. But let me, let me turn now to your questions. Uh, uh, would, uh, I'd like to ask three things before, you, uh, before we get started. First, wait for the microphone, uh, because uh, the online audience won't hear your question uh, unless you have it in your hand. Uh, second, if you have a question for a specific person on the panel, uh, let them know. But before you get to that, the third point, which is actually number two, is tell us your name and organization uh, before you get started. But uh, if you have a if you're directing to a specific member of the panel, that's fine. If you want a general question, a toss-up question, that's okay too. But uh, thank you. So, any questions? Yes, sir. Thank you, Manny Manriquez. I'm the director of the Japan Automobile Manufacturers Association, and uh, my member companies have uh, are facing many of the same issues uh, that you're identifying here today. Um, you know, now that the election is over, I think we can sort of take a deep breath and and uh, you know talk about government policy on its merits. And so my question to anyone on the panel who, who can answer this is, uh, what role do you see um, programs like TAA or WIOA playing in providing uh, you know, the, the workers that, that are needed and uh, with the STEM skills that are required to do these jobs? I'm not familiar with those either. Unfortunately, I am, so I think this one's for me. <laughs> Um, what we have found in a lot of existing workforce programs, whether they're federally or state funded, is they have focused frequently on not the incumbent worker, and they haven't always worried about what the real jobs are going to be going forward, so they have a nasty tendency to train people for jobs that aren't there or don't give them skill sets to be able to stay in the job they have today. Um, 
what we have found where we're able to work with those agencies, particularly in things like layoff aversion, is that if we know soon enough, we can work with the company and typically the local community college to start to put skills in place, particularly if it's around lean manufacturing principles that usually make an impact and more often than not will help get that company to stay put and perhaps not lay off as many people as they would. A couple of quick observations about federal jobs programs. <clears throat> the first one is uh, uh, that like many programs of the U.S. government, that's mostly what we think about if we're here in Washington, many programs of the U.S. government are, are uh, have characteristics uh, of the, the era in which they were created. So if you, look at, if you look at American farm policy, no matter how much agricultural production modernizes, it's still the Dust Bowl because the farm programs as they are were created in the 1930s in response to that, um, that uh, climate crisis at the, at the time. Uh, much like our, our tax laws, our international tax policy, like it or not, it's still 1962 because that's when the concept was, was, was put in place and the, and the structures administratively were created. And they tend to retain that for a long time. What we have in jobs program at, at the federal level is, I, I think there are over 30. I heard the number 33 from a member of Congress, but it's something in that ballpark of separate federal jobs programs of one sort or another with very little coordination, very little evidence-based uh, uh, management, in fact, little evidence at all that any of these programs are actually working. And then I'll add my suspicion to it, not fact, just my opinion, that it is likely that though many of those programs were created in an era uh, f for which the kind of jobs they're, they're intended to produce or the training they're intended to deliver is no longer relevant. The, the world seems, is, in my judgment, is just changing too fast. So I want, to, I want to put in a plug, while we're in Washington and we think about the federal government all the time, I want to put in a plug for federalism. Uh, and, and I think there's an opportunity for more of what Jim's organization does in Ohio. And there's, there's more opportunity for real creativity and application at the state level. And maybe, Jim, you could just say a, a word about what was, it, what, what, were, what was in place when you showed up at Jobs Ohio and which programs were sufficiently outmoded that you moved away from them? Uh, well, well, really, we, we didn't take any of the programs that the state had for economic development. We started from scratch and uh, approached it that way. Probably maybe, maybe a wise thing to do here. Hard to do in Washington, but it's, it's good advice. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, my name is Matilde Benefla. I'm a student at neighbor of Penn State, University of Pennsylvania, currently working at Brookings. I'm interested in trade, international trade negotiations. And I was wondering, it seems like a lot of the focus for why jobs are not materializing properly is really rooted in education and how we're teaching science. But as we all know from both sides of the aisle, a lot of the conversation around manufacturing jobs has been about trade and the effects that international trade have. So I was wondering in your experience, is that really overstated in political discourse or is that really something you've encountered in your daily lives? So I'll, I'll just answer that from, the, from our company's perspective. We intend and have, have done for decades manufacture where we sell. That's primarily our strategy. We may have to import, export, you know, occasionally to get the right product to the right market, uh, but fundamentally we manufacture where we sell. Uh, so I think, you know, going back to, you know, has, so has trade affected Kohler companies to, so, to, to, to some extent, but frankly it's, you know, the availability of talent in the market, you know, is going to dictate the, our ability to grow, frankly, in that market. And if we can't get the talent in the market, it's going to be very hard to create the product for the market. So um, I would actually go back to your first point on education and say that I'd like to see an education strategy to address STEM. You know, and it could be something, it will be something that has to be a 5, 10, 15 year strategy. But we have to start building the pipeline and support public education um, you know, that, that actually has a component for both manufacturing and for higher skilled STEM jobs. Yeah, just to build on Laura's answer, um, <clears throat> on a macro level, 
uh, we make more things in the United States than ever before. Inflation-adjusted manufacturing output is at an all-time high and about 40% higher than it was 20, 25 years ago. So it's a substantial increase. However, manufacturing uses fewer people to make that greater level of output. A similar thing happened over the last century in American agriculture. If we had have held this seminar 100 years ago, over 40% of us would have been farmers. Today, 2% of us are farmers. Okay. Now, lots of changes happened, but productivity, increased crop yields, uh, mechanization of agriculture, all those kinds of improvements which raise productivity, raise living standards, likewise simultaneously reduce the, the number of employees required to produce a certain level of output. That's certainly happening in manufacturing in the United States, and as part of a global uh, essentially distribution of, of skills and, and specialization, uh, which is definitely happening. And that's why you're hearing so much about high skill manufacturing, because what we make in the United States, so the, the end of the question is, what we make in the United States is things that require high skill, sophisticated technology. Uh, if you want a, uh, a Happy Meal toy airplane, it's probably going to be imported. If you want a Boeing, it's probably made in the United States. Right? And, and there's a big technology difference between the, the Happy Meal toy and the 787. And, and that, that, that distribution of labor has happened worldwide to the improvement of the world, frankly. Uh, what we have to deal with is uh, it, the, the Mexicans probably didn't take your job, but the robots may. <laughs> and, and dealing with the fact that this higher level of, of, of technology incorporated in work creates a different demand for skills and a different profile and is, is part of the challenge that, that certainly these companies and, and, uh, and uh, associations face. So thank you. Thank you for the question. And at, at this, before you go on, at the same time, you have high-skill, high-tech industries like high-speed train sets, but the number of opportunities currently in the U.S. for those are like two. So you're either going to sell something to Amtrak for the Acela, or in California, you've got the beginnings of high-speed rail service between Los Angeles and San Francisco. The state of California has asked for a waiver for some of those manufactured pieces of equipment because there are no domestic sources. But if you look at the investment the federal government made in those, it's we did this with the notion that you were going to develop this industry in the U.S., not use it to import other parts. But if you can't find it and it adds millions of dollars to your train set, you're sort of between a rock and a hard place with taxpayer dollars. So which do you want and what are you willing to give up to get it? Um, in Amtrak's case, they got a waiver to buy foreign goods. California's got to go through the process. Uh, they may end up in the same place. They may not. Yes, one final question. Thank you. Laura Dawson, Canada Institute, Wilson Center. My question is about the changing nature of jobs and work and skills. Our graduates now know they're not going to get cradle-to-grave employment. They're going to have many jobs in their lifetime. And we've sold that pretty well. You know, you're not here for a long time, but you'll be here for a good time. For you folks that are working on, on the ground in industry, how transferable are those skills? If I've got the skills that you need, Laura, to work in, uh, in advanced manufacturing in your plant, can I then take those same skills if I decide to relocate to Seattle and work in Boeing or work in the auto sector? What's, what's, the, what's the transferability and fungibility of the sort of advanced level skills that you folks are looking for? Well, I would say absolutely those skills are transferable. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, we don't have cradle to grave uh, desire from our associates anymore. It's not only that, it's, it's really that they are not looking for that. Their, their, their parents had that cradle to grave mentality of I'm staying with a company for my career. But they want transferable skills. And they want skills that will continue, that companies will continue in, to invest in them, to upskill them so that they stay current. It's their expectation. What are you going to do for me? 
manufacturer, right? And so we do have to work on that employment value pro proposition of, you know, we want you to stay with us, we want to engender loyalty, we will continue to invest in you and your skill set, knowing all the time that they can easily take those exact same skills and go to Boeing. So yeah. it, it makes the pressure on the manufacturer much, uh, much more intense to make us the, the employer of choice. And the competition will go after those employees. Well, absolutely. If you don't, if you don't. And at the same time, how do you, as the employee, demonstrate you have those skills? One of the things we've been working on is actually a project with the American National Standards Institute, their nonprofit work cred, to look at the whole range of workforce certificates and try and see if we can find which ones have actual value. And then hopefully those can go into the concept called stackable certificates. So you can take all of those from employer to employer as you go through your career, knowing you're going to have more than one employer. Well, we're about to change the scene from, uh, from uh, summary of the demand side issues to summary of the supply side issues. But before we do that, please join me in thanking this marvelous panel for their great input. Thank you. Science and technology capabilities are going to be in high demand looking at the future. The McKinsey Global Institute predicts a shortage of 38 to 40 million highly skilled STEM workers by 2020. That is 13% of the necessary STEM workforce. Most of our doctoral degrees in science and technology are non-US citizens. We need to have the capability to attract and retain those highly skilled people in the U.S. While large numbers of foreign-born students earn STEM degrees in the U.S., those graduates are increasingly leaving the U.S. to pursue STEM careers in their home countries or other nations that make immigration attractive. Each year, U.S. Immigration Services allots about 85,000 H-1B visas. There were 233,000 applicants for those 85,000 slots. Clearly, the demand is exceeding the supply. What U.S. policies and initiatives need to be implemented so that we continue to be the most attractive economy for high-skilled science and technology in a global marketplace? Well, I don't know that I've ever been accused of being a supply-sider, but um, that's the uh, topic for uh, our second panel today, uh, the supply side uh, of the uh, labor issue as it 
uh, pertains to STEM. Um, I'm reminded of a white paper uh, produced by one of the big four accounting firms uh, about two years ago uh, describing uh, the skills that they believe accountants of the future will uh, need. Uh, and it was things like the ability to program in R, uh, the ability to uh, perform and interpret multivariate logistic regression. Uh, these are skills that, uh, as a dean of a business school, I do not see uh, coming from business students. I see it, them coming from STEM students that might acquire a little business sense along the way. Uh, but if we're talking about skills like that, uh, they're not going to be acquired by students who have had one semester of business calculus. It's just not going to happen. Uh, so uh, there are a number of uh, issues uh, when it comes to the supply of STEM-capable uh, uh, students uh, from our colleges and universities. Uh, and I'm uh, delighted uh, to uh, turn it over to the panel for some opening remarks. Uh, first, I'll turn to my colleague, uh, Professor Fari Ghadar, uh, who is the William A. Schreier Professor of Global Management Policies and Planning uh, at the Smeal College of Business. Fari? Oh, thank you, Dean Whitman. Um, one of the key issues is we can try to develop science, technology, engineering, and math skills. But that typically takes a very long time. So one option is to look at very carefully uh, the capability that others have um, internationally and attract them to come to the states. Um, we have traditionally been very successful in doing that. Um, uh, in fact, uh, one of the statistics that I was impressed with was that of the 500 Fortune 500 companies, 42 percent reported in 2012 were started by immigrants. So immigrants have actually been very active in our, in our economy and have been responsible for a substantial portion of our GDP. Those 500 Fortune 500 countries, companies represented 30 percent of U.S. GDP. Uh, the Fiscal Policy Institute also shows that even in small businesses, uh, they've generated somewhere around, again in 2012, 776 billion, million dollars, billion dollars, and employed about 4.7 uh, million people during that time period, 1999 to 2012. Um, we have historically heard about it's specific ones like eBay's Pierre Omidyar or uh, Serge Abrams, Google, but we also hear smaller companies like uh, Chegg, uh, this Penn State graduate that uh, uses a Netflix type of operation for textbooks. Um, Chegg is kind of interesting. It's a combination of chicken and egg, so you put it together called Chegg. It's kind of <laughs> interesting. <laughs> But also on the larger side, we have uh, uh, somebody like uh, Zuckerberg that constantly in his op-ed say he, they're having difficulty hiring appropriate people because they don't have the stem cell capabilities they need to. And so he's arguing for a much larger H-1B categorization allowance. Now, um, so you would say, well, that's great. Uh, that's doing a wonderful job and we're very, very successful. But over time, what's happened is it's become more and more difficult to get these highly skilled people to stay in the states, enhance our economy. Uh, so one statistics, for example, um, on Sil in Silicon Valley, a third of uh, the engineers and scientists are immigrants. And Kaufman Foundation did an extensive study in 2015 and it showed that um, while in 2005, 52.4% of startups in Silicon Valley were by immigrants, by the time you come a decade later, that drop was 43.9. Now you would say, well, 43.9 is still a significant amount and immigrants are doing a great job, but that's an 8% drop. So the question becomes, what is happening? 
are we losing the capability of attracting highly skilled people in the U.S.? And a corollary to that would be, uh, where are they going? Well, two things are happening. One is uh, many of the PhD graduates, the master graduates, uh, engineering and stem cell, stem uh, background are going back home. So there are opportunities for them to go back to their home country, whether it's China, India, or somewhere else. Um, the second one is that some of the competing developed countries are being much more aggressive and much more effective in attracting them. So um, my colleague here, Laura Dawson, will talk about Canada. Canada's been extremely effective in attracting skilled people. Australia has been much more attractive. New Zealand's been much So other countries are also actively trying to promote uh, the acceptance of uh, highly skilled people. And, and just as a end story, I was uh, driving in Silicon Valley, and I pulled out of Apple, and there was this huge billboard that basically said, I'm paraphrasing, if you're having difficulty with your immigration, come visit us in Canada. <laughs> and, and so I thought that was kind of an interesting, interesting story. So um, yes, immigrants have been very helpful in promoting our economy. They continue to do so. But as time goes by, it is becoming more and more difficult to keep them in the States if they're getting their PhD and attract them while we're competing with other developed countries and their home countries. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Um, Laura Dawson is director of the Canada Institute, uh, Woodrow Wilson Center, and I think it's uh, a uh, great time to turn it over to you to talk about what Canada's doing to all of our STEM uh, folks in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Not only am I the director of the Canada Institute, I am a card-carrying Canadian and a holder of an H-1B visa. Um, so I can speak to uh, this conversation on, on many levels. Um, I think if I were to be impudent, I would say the 21st century, the American economic edge is having Canada next door as your laboratory on what works and what doesn't work, and also as a source of, of talent exports. There are one million Canadians wandering around in the United States, but you don't know it because we conceal ourselves so well. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons why Canada is a good lab for the United States is because our uh, demographic uh, pressures and realities have hit us earlier and harder than in the United States. Uh, as you know, Canada is a bigger landmass than the United States, but smaller population. The population is about the same size as California, so it's a one-tenth uh, ratio, about the same population size and about the same GDP as California. So think of the population of California stretched over an enormous landmass. Canada is also an aging population. Uh, we have a significant uh, baby boom population, which is getting old, consuming more social services, and leaving the workforce. The average age of a, compu of a, of a tower crane operator in Toronto is 64 years old. Um, I, uh, I, I have many friends who are 64 years old. There's nothing wrong with that age, but as a tower crane operator, I suggest if you're driving down Young Street in Toronto, you look up. Um, so we have an aging population. Uh, we have demographic pressures. Um, we in Canada were uh, not looking great in our stem cell development. We were ranked 20 out of 23. Uh, by the OECD in terms of our STEM skills development. Um, but one of the great things about Canada is we can mobilize fairly quickly. We can come up with new programs and plans fairly quickly, especially when we're in those halcyon days as we are now, where we have a majority government in power. If the Prime Minister and Cabinet decides to do something, it pretty much happens. Um, so this new government is looking very, very, has been looking very seriously about upskilling Canada, bringing in uh, 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 new uh, skilled personnel, but also developing homegrown talent. Uh, so I think that what uh, the three things that I would focus on in talking this morning, and I won't do them all at once, um, 
is that uh, in order to get the skills where and when they are needed in Canada, we've taken three approaches, permanent migration, temporary migration, and grow your own. Um, all three of those have worked and are working fairly well, but all of them have problems as well. Uh, this new government is really focusing on the permanent migration and, uh, and grow your own skills. In terms of permanent migration, Canada has upped its permanent migration numbers to 300,000 for this year, which is a big number for a country that has a population of just over 35 million. Uh, the government uh, 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 analysts are suggesting that it be beefed up even more to 450,000 a year. Of that, uh, of those permanent migration numbers, more than 60% of those are in the economic class, and Canada uses a points, as has been implementing, a points-based system of uh, economic migration. So that's based on skills, education, language, uh, work experience, and having a relationship with a Canadian employer. All of those things will boost your points, and if you have a certain number of points, you get facilitated, expedited access to Canada. We didn't invent this. I think much of the Canadian model is based on the Australian model. They really uh, uh, broke ground with this uh, about a decade ago, and we've been sort of following along behind. Um, I won't talk about our temporary program right now. I think Alex is probably going to talk a little bit about H-1Bs, and Canada has a version of that that's sort of worked in some respects and sort of hasn't worked in other respects. In terms of grow your own skills, I worked uh, last year with the Canadian video game industry um, who noted that it's really expensive to bring in temporary foreign workers to fill um, high-tech jobs in Canada. It's much easier um, and a better business decision in the long run, run to, to grow those skills domestically, but it's not easy. Uh, we heard the speakers in the first panel talk about uh, a domestic innovation strategy, and that's really what it comes down to. It's not just about teaching code coding to kids, it's really about having the whole package of incentives, uh, innovation, uh, retaining mechanisms, and smart policies so that once you have grown your own skilled workers, they stay where you've, uh, where you've nurtured them. Um, and the, the final point that we can talk about if you want is movement of skills across borders. My gosh, movement across borders is going to be very difficult perhaps, under your new government. We'll see how that works, but there are many, many reasons to foster uh, increased labor mobility to get skills where and when they are needed quickly and efficiently. Thanks. Uh, let me now turn it over to Alex Nalitek, uh, the uh, uh, immigration policy analyst in the Cato Institute, uh, to talk about uh, his perspective. Well, thank you very much. I think one of the first things we need to do in order to strip away a lot of, uh, is to strip away a lot of myths so that we can attack this sort of issue and problem, knowing what's going on. One of the biggest myths is that we like to pat ourselves on the back and say we're a nation of immigrants and anybody can come here and do well, but if, uh, any cursory glance at our immigration system, I think, should disabuse you of that notion. Historically, that's certainly true, uh, but not today. Uh, Laura mentioned uh, just a second ago about 300,000 or so immigrants annually to Canada. As a percentage of their population, it's about 0.9% uh, annually flow into Canada. By comparison, the annual flow into the U.S. of green card workers is about 0.3% of the population. It's so about one-third as an, uh, the quantity in terms of the annual flow. So if a country deserves the name today in the current world as a nation of immigrants, I think Canada has done more to earn that as well as uh, Australia have, both of which have much higher immigrant populations as a percentage uh, of their country. And I think that we can look to them to also get some ideas about how to go forward and how to reform the immigration systems to allow more skilled workers. But I think there are three primary reasons to want to do that all centered around the idea that immigration, especially high-skilled immigration, is very beneficial for Americans. And there's three ways in which that is the case. Uh, one of them is through patenting and new ideas. Now, patenting is not the best, necessarily the best measure of innovation, but it's one of the better ones that we have that we can actually take a look at. And what we find is that in 2006, for example, 
about a quarter of all of the international patents that were filed from the United States had a, a non-American or a uh, foreign-born co-inventor on these patents, up from about 7% in 1998. So you see a big overrepresentation of foreign-born individuals in patenting. By comparison, only about 13% of the entire population is foreign-born. We also see that a 1% increase in immigrants who are college graduates uh, in metro areas in the United States leads to about to 9 to 18 percent in patenting uh, in the United States. So a disproportionate outsized influence in terms of the uh, amount of innovation. We also see it especially concentrated in areas like in semiconductors uh, where 87 percent of the patents have an immigrant uh, either filer or co-filer, 84% for information technology patents, 79% for drugs and drug companies. So we see a big overrepresentation of immigrants in these areas. Second is productivity growth uh, in the United States. Uh, there's a famous paper by Charles Jones, and I believe it's in a journal of political economy, where he takes a look at what economists call TFP. Now, we're not really good as economists at measuring a lot of things, but what TFP is is sort of trying to get at productivity. It takes a look at the productivity increases that occur that can't be measured by the quantity of labor or capital. And it sort of assigns this residual amount to TFP. And what Charles Jones found is from 1950 to 1993, about half of all this productivity growth in the US uh, is attributable to the growth and the number and the, and the share of engineers and scientists uh, in the US workforce at that time. And what we know is taking a look at the share of the engineers and scientists today, grossly overrepresented uh, by immigrants, uh, many of whom graduated from American universities, but also many uh, who came from overseas. And we can see this represented today from night picking up sort of where Charles Jones left off, uh, economist Perry Sheehan Sparber uh, took a look at the number of H-1B workers in metro areas, 219 metro areas in the United States from 1990 when the program was created to 2010, and they found that uh, the variation in H-1Bs, basically more H-1Bs are responsible for about 10 to 25 percent of total productivity growth across these metro areas. So that's a very big contribution to American growth uh, during these time periods. And then the third area that uh, was mentioned before was entrepreneurship. Um, a lot, uh, immigrants, according to the Kauffman Foundation, are about twice as likely to start a firm uh, any given year. That accounts for the low end of um, uh, firms, so a lot of like markets, we, uh, you know, uh, small markets, bodegas, things like that. But they're also overrepresented on the high end of the spectrum. So uh, some work from the National Foundation of American Policy, 2005 to 2012. About 44% of tech and engineering startups in the U.S. had an engineering, uh, immigrant co-founder. Uh, suffice it to say, they're more than uh, tw uh, three times as represented amongst uh, co-founders in this field as they are in the population as a whole. And what we know, looking at the Kauffman Foundation work, is that growth in employment, growth in wages, growth in productivity is pretty closely correlated to firm creation uh, in the United States. So increasing the firm birth rate is one excellent way to go about this. Now, of course, there's going to be a lot of pushback on this issue. Wages is one of the major uh, pushbacks that you hear for any kind of immigration reform. People think that these high-skilled workers are taking people's wages, they're lowering wages, taking jobs, et cetera. First thing to recognize is the United States uh, economy is not a fixed pie. Uh, because you make a dollar or own a job does not mean that you took it from somebody else. In fact, given the way things work in this economy, just applying normal lessons from Adam Smith, where the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market, having more people and having a larger market actually increases the amount of opportunity, the division of labor, and the skilled work that can occur in the United States. Uh, the international market for skilled workers is relatively elastic. A large increase, that means a large increase in supply will not affect wa lower wages that much. So that's one way to take a look at it. Um, and just to put all this in perspective, uh, in about 2010, uh, the BLS did a quick study of um, the value of different forms of capital in the United States. And they found that the physical capital and plants and firms, et cetera, uh, the machines that make the goods that we need or that we demand uh, is worth about $45 trillion, just the physical stock. Uh, the, meanwhile, the value of uh, household wealth, houses, these types of things uh, held by private households is worth about $70 trillion. Meanwhile, the value of human capital, the skills, the uh, ambitions, the ability to work and produce in the United States is worth about $750 trillion. 
Now, I know we're in Washington, D.C., when a trillion dollars doesn't count for very much, uh, but that's still real money. And this is something where we can increase the largest share of that, the value of it, dramatically by liberalizing high-skilled immigration. It's great to hear someone other than an educator say that uh, human capital is so, so important. Uh, we, uh, and those of us in higher education are in the human capital accumulation business. Uh, and so uh, having somebody else say, uh, let's get more of it, uh, is a great thing. Uh, let me turn to some specific questions, and let me start uh, with Professor Gadar. Uh, can you say something about what, what has happened? What is the condition uh, in terms of our willingness uh, to welcome in, uh, immigrants? Uh, has it uh, declined from uh, historical levels? Uh, is there more reticence uh, about it these days? Um. What we see happen, if we, if we go and look very long term, as David mentioned earlier on, um, immigrants as a percentage of the population has always been around 15, 16 percent. So we've had a very large percentage of immigrants in our economy. In the 70s, that number went down. And more recently, in 2000, it started going up. And we're now around 12, 13 percent. Um, so immigrants have actually in the past decade or so, increased as a percentage of the overall population. However, as Alex mentioned, um, we really, if you look at globally, um, it would be a stretch to say we are a nation of immigrants if we define immigrants as people that were born outside of the US who are now in the States. That 13% is in line with France, it's in line with Germany, um, I don't particularly consider France a nation of immigrants. <laughs> okay. um, that number, however, is nearly twice in Canada, 24, 25 percent, which is consistent with uh, the capability of attracting them there. That number is, again, in the 20s for Australia, 20s for Singapore, 20s for New Zealand, et cetera. So um, we have been successful in attracting immigrants, and they they have been a significant player in our economy. My worry is looking forward. Um, the drop in companies started by immigrants, which is a statistics that Alex brought out and I mentioned earlier, um, going from 53 to 40, you know, 43, 45 may not seem like a lot, but that's really a 20% drop, 20% drop in a decade. Um, then you just, you know, the story of the, the person in the airplane that couldn't get into the U.S. because of H-1B visas, uh, but yet he was in an industry that we are very interested in, fracking. Uh, if you look at some of the clusters, um, historically U.S. has been very, very good at developing clusters of economies. So in the 50s, we had the auto cluster because of Eisenhower going into the road thing. Then we had Silicon Valley with the clusters of IT. Um, if you look forward to the clusters of biotech or the clusters of uh, nanotech, et cetera, I don't see an active mechanism to attract these people into a cluster. Now, Silicon Valley is doing okay, but what is the biotech industry doing? Um, how successful is Boston being in terms of creating a cluster of technologies as opposed to the British, for example, or um, nanotechnology as compared to the clusters that are begin developing in Shanghai? So my worry is not so much where we've been in the past decade. My worry is more what's going to happen looking a decade in the future, and what does that mean in terms of U.S. public policy? Laura, let me ask uh, if you could kind of follow up on that and, and tell us a little bit about what Canada has done that's uh, been successful, and maybe talk about some of the things that haven't been successful. 
And I've talked a bit about uh, the permanent migration, um, that, but it's really more of a, of a necessity than, than an option at this point. Uh, as I mentioned, Canada has had a very flexible approach to temporary movement of, of people to high demand jobs. Rather than the H-1B, which is quota limited, Canada had a temporary foreign worker program, which was based on identifying a need in a particular high demand sector. And once the need was established with the employer, Canada would say to the employer, okay, you go ahead, hire as many people as you need. Uh, um, and uh, you know, let us know how that goes. So there was no quota limitation on the Canadian program. It was very effective, but there were not enough uh, controls and safeguards on it. So it ended up being abused. The same program that, basically the same program that was used to bring in people to pick tomatoes in the fields of Southern Ontario was also being used to bring people into write code at uh, high tech firms in Vancouver. Uh, two very different groups, two very different groups needing different levels of protection and supervision and oversight. That program got a very, very bad rap uh, in Canada and justifiably so, there were some abuses definitely. Um, also, the labor market would move at a different pace than the government's ability to respond with these new programs. So, for example, I worked on a program to get U.S. workers into the oil sands, you know, uh, welders, electricians, engineers. We have the same unions. We have the same uh, education base. So, uh, it's relatively easy, it should be relatively easy to move U.S unemployed workers into high demand places in Canada. Um, but by the time we got all the moving pieces in place with the Canadian programs and the certifications and the skills, and uh, we also had to, for, for certain workers, get a number of um, uh, waivers for DUIs, because you're certain things that you can't cross the border with. And so we had to engage uh, the governor of Montana into getting blanket waivers for DUIs uh, to get folks into, into Alberta. Anyway, it, by the time we got all of the moving pieces in place for this program, the price of oil plummeted and the demand disappeared. So uh, it, it, it was very hard for Canada to sort of I hate to say it, watch where the puck was going um, on these programs. Uh, at the same time, you do need short-term responsive programs. The last government canceled them all. The new government is now putting some back in place, particularly for the high-tech sector and the ICT industry, which, which is very, very good. Um, the longer term strategy, and as Alex was pointing out to me last night, it takes 15 years to grow your own um, uh, ICT STEM, uh, STEM workers, uh, is, uh, is to focus on, on our youth. And in particular, if you don't catch them in K-12, to you're not going to catch them at all. Um, that is where the majority of focus of, for example, the video game industry of Canada is on, is in the K-12 to sector. Um, the working, one of the problems they have is that if they have a teacher who was born prior to 1986, they didn't have a home computer in their house growing up. So you really have a, a age 30 divide. Teachers under 30 get this. They get coding skills, mathematical skills, computer skills, the, the digital skills that are necessary. They may not have mastered them, but they're not afraid of them. Old folks like me, it's like, oh, I don't know, there'd be dragons over there. So reaching the teachers and giving the supports to teachers to uh, 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 affect this K-12 group is, is really important. Working with industry is hugely important. Uh, Ubisoft, the big video game company in Canada, uh, Electronic Arts, another one, uh, they are both uh, working with the teachers associations in their provinces and cities to uh, teach code and uh, teach other digital skills to kids. Also, uh, attracting non-traditional groups. Um, this is, uh, you know, the, the young male geek is no longer the only game in town. We have to ensure that STEM cells and STEM uh, intensive jobs are available and interesting to a broad uh, base of the population. Uh, traditional underrepresented groups, women in Canada, First Nations people, uh, uh, people with disabilities, etc. Uh, Canada is focusing on bringing those groups in uh, as well. Um, uh, as well of 
it's not only important for industry to be reaching out to the um, uh, reaching out to the schools themselves, but also to build connective tissue among different training uh, organizations. So, for example, Bombardier, the big Canadian uh, aircraft and uh, domestic transportation company, it has established a program at the Aerospace School in Montreal, but it's also established a program at the Engineering School in Querétaro, Mexico. So those professors from the Aerospace School in Montreal are on constant transfer in Querétaro, where Bombardier is building a lot of its aircraft. So they're, they're uh, building supply chain networks for skills across borders, which is really interesting. Um, they're also looking at ways to make skills more fungible. I asked that question in the first panel. How do you uh, retrain? How do you move people from one sector to another? The now dinosaur company of Nortel um, noticed that people with physics degrees were actually really good at computer uh, science as well. So they had a program which would accelerate uh, physicists into uh, programming and tech, tech jobs at Nortel. Um, there, we're finding that it's important not to be too specific, um, that in addition to uh, digital skills, mathematics skills, etc., we also need critical thinking and analytic skills. Um, and so in Canada, there's a move from, from STEM to STEAM, and the A is arts. Now, if I look at it and say, okay, you need good scientific and mathematical and analytic and, and critical and reasoning skills, that sounds like a sound arts and science education to me. I mean, it sounds like a throwback to what we were aspiring to 30 or 40 years ago. Um, and finally, and probably most importantly, the Canadian strategy is focusing on uh, an enabling environment, a nurturing environment for these skills so that once we've got uh, well-trained young people and, and immigrants and others who are interesting, interested in these sectors, how do we retain them? Um, how do we ensure that it is a good environment for startups, that there are incubators, um, that there are opportunities for technology transfer, that there are incentives for commercialization of technology? My son uh, is a data architect. I think that's a good thing, and he seems to really like his job. He works for a startup whose largest customer works in Canada, but his largest customer is actually the U.S. government. And his team is in San Diego, uh, Toronto, and, uh, and Denmark right now. And so he manages this team. And my son is not inclined to leave uh, Ottawa. He loves where he lives. He loves the weather. He, I don't know why. He, lo <laughs> he loves the, uh, uh, the lifestyle. It's green. It's clean. It's a good place to raise a family. Every week he receives offers to move to the U.S., to move elsewhere, to work for other companies. So far, Canada's done a pretty good job of retaining him and retaining his company as well. But it's, it's, it's a Jenga game of ensuring that enough, um, uh, enough incentives and supports are there to ensure that good skills want to stay in, in the community. That's it. Well, not to be outdone, my son <laughs> makes corn planters. Uh, he's an electrical engineer, uh, and his job is to make sure that the seeds are dispensed the same distance apart from one another when the planter is going around a corner. Uh, the, in, the seeds on the inside of the, the circle and the seeds on the outside of the circle. Uh, so STEM has, has come to uh, uh, farm implement manufacturing. Um, Alex, I wonder if uh, we could follow up uh, with a theme that has... Um, characterized uh, several of the comments, and that is there's a distinction in skill uh, between, uh, as Laura put it, uh, workers who were being brought in to pick tomatoes and workers who were being brought in to write code. And it seems to me, anyway, that some of the angst about uh, immigration uh, comes uh, from people who believe that their uh, jobs lifting things, low-skilled jobs, would be displaced by immigrants, whereas uh, the, a lot of the statistics that you quoted, for example, have to do with uh, workers at the other end of the skill spectrum. Uh, as a matter of public policy, is there something that, that we could do here uh, to make a, a stronger distinction between these two types of labor and uh, perhaps make some uh, headway on this H-1B visa issue at the top of the skill spectrum? 
All right, let me begin, uh, begin by saying my son's only about four and a half months old. He does, he, the things he makes are of negative value uh, so far. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the high and low skill distinction uh, in American law, um, a lot, I think you're correct that a lot of the worry that people have is about uh, competition on the low end side uh, of the labor market. Um, but compared to the high end, coming in as a low skilled worker is actually harder <laughs> legally to do that than on the high end. Um, I think we can do a better job of making that distinction, but whereas there's 85,000 H-1Bs for workers and firms every year, there's 140,000 employment-based green cards, about half of which actually go to the workers. Um, for low-skilled workers, there's about 66,000 H-2Bs, they're seasonal workers, uh, work in tourist occupations generally. And then there's a H-2A for agriculture, uh, workers, seasonal agricultural workers, um, it's technically doesn't have a limit, but due to regulations and stuff, it's about 150 to 200,000 uh, a year, and it's uh, less than a year, and they go back and forth. Um, I do think a lot of these issues are sometimes conflated in people's minds, and it leads to really bad uh, results. People think that, for instance, the majority of immigrants in the U.S. today are illegal immigrants, which just is not true. It's about a quarter uh, maximum, and that worries people a lot about the competition on the low end side uh, of the labor market. But in terms of what we can do, what I'm most worried about is the total lack of a visa for mid-skilled workers. So welders, for instance, mid-level uh, uh, um, workers in uh, in industry of some kind, or there's some skilled workers that don't have a college or a graduate degree, jobs that are called usually blue collar jobs like plumbers that they do make quite a lot of money uh, in the United States, especially compared to working overseas, but there's no visa available for these workers. There's large wage increases for some of these types of workers in different parts of the country. You don't really see a movement of Americans to try to take up these jobs regardless of what's going on uh, in terms of um, uh, the wages there. But one of the things that is most talked about is while well, we need to cut off immigration of all skill levels, and we need to make sure that Americans do these jobs or the skilled jobs. Well, I'd like to hear them explain to me my way, making it you know, a higher wage in lower mid-level workers is supposed to attract people into the high-skilled occupations. It's sort of the exact opposite of mainstream economics. So labor protectionism in one portion of the labor market can have actually the opposite effect of what we want to do in terms of the rest of it. And one of my favorite papers about this shows that having more low-skilled immigration actually increases the amount of high-skilled workers. Uh, by, it's by Patricia Cortez, and what she found is in urban areas where there are low-skilled immigrants, the price of nannying decreases. So high-skilled women who leave the labor market to have children are much more likely to, one, re-enter working, and two, to do it a lot quicker. So if you want to increase, paradox, it might seem paradoxical to some people, but if you want to increase the supply of American high-skilled workers, one of the things you could do is to uh, bump up the increase of low-skilled workers so that Americans, especially uh, high-skilled American women, are much less likely to leave the workforce permanently. If, if I could add to that, the bimodal nature of American immigration is, is very interesting. It's very atypical of most countries. Uh, we have on one hand the low skill, and then we have the H-1B visas. In the middle is where many of the companies uh, actually sort of medium skilled uh, don't have uh, access to it, and there's no mechanism to bring them in. And if you uh, listen carefully to what Laura Kohler was saying, many of those skills were not really completely high skilled. They were kind of middle skilled, and that was the area they were, she was having the most difficulty with, so I just wanted to reinforce that. Can I jump in as, as well? Just uh, uh, the young lady's question about uh, trade agreements and whether trade agreements are having a, a, a negative effect on, on skills and employment. Um, I would argue absolutely not, but what I think is having a negative effect on, on skilling of America and, Canadi and Canada is, you know, back to Alex's point about affordable child care. Uh, affordable child care, uh, uh, reasonable maternity leave, access to education and retraining, uh, affordable health care that isn't necessarily tied to the employer. I mean, these are all the soft, mushy, mushy social bits that are key to developing a highly skilled workforce regardless of social class or gender. 
Thank you. Um, before we throw it open to questions from the audience, I just have one more question for Alex. Um, we've talked about H-1B issues and H-2 uh, issues. Uh, is there a possibility of an H-1 and a half that can be done without an act of Congress? Can you, can you tell us kind of what sorts of things can we do in the immigration space uh, with and without uh, Congress's help? So one of the big issues that uh, could be is uh, the area I mentioned was the employment-based green card. Um, so this is a, what we think of high-skilled workers coming in from abroad, uh, working here, 140,000 of them a year is what's set aside uh, in American law. However, there's been interpretation since this law has been passed, an executive interpretation um, that counts the family members of these workers against that 140,000 number. So when you actually drill down into the workers who come in, it's uh, fewer than half of that are workers. So somewhere around 67,000 of those 140,000 a year are the actual workers themselves. Now, I have nothing against families uh, coming in, but one of the things the president could do uh, the first day he is in office is say that we're going to interpret this statute as the words on the page literally say, which is that only the workers themselves are going to be counted against that cap. Now, one of the things that that will do is it could increase the flow from abroad immediately, but one of the better things it will do is get people out of the H-1B. Now, the H-1B is a fine visa in a lot of ways, um, but it's a feeder system, really, to the employment-based green card. And one of the problems is mobility is diminished for them. They can't start firms, et cetera. There's some restrictions on them while they're on the H-1B, but holding out that option, making it easier to eventually get lawful permanent residence, uh, will uh, incentivize more of them to try in the first place and more of them to want to try through the H-1B uh, to be here permanently. And just to give you another silly regulation that makes this uh, very difficult is only 7% of the people getting the employment-based green card in any year can come from any one country. So if you're Indian, if you're Chinese, if you're Filipino, you will have to wait decades to be able to get that employment-based green card while working on your H-1B. If you're from Iceland or the Democratic Republic of the Congo or uh, some other country with a very small population that doesn't send many immigrants here, you'll be able to get your uh, employment-based green card relatively quickly when it comes to that. Now, I, I don't see any good reason in looking at the congressional debates over this. I've seen no good reason uh, why the ability to get a green card should be based on your nationality. Um, I thought that was something, I've been told anyway, that that's something the United States got rid of in immigration law in the 60s, uh, but it lives on in this one obscure part of uh, employment-based green cards. Well, silly regulations. Imagine those terms going together in Washington, D.C. <laughs> so I'd like to uh, throw it open to questions uh, from the audience. Same ground rules as in the previous session. Uh, wait for the microphone, uh, identify yourself, and if you're directing the question to a specific uh, panel member, uh, please make that indication. So, uh, Jerry Kessler, Wells Fargo Advisors. We have a new regime in Washington now, and all three parts are of the same party, which is usually when things get done. I'm going to ask for volunteers, but are the chances of getting something done better now or worse or what? Uh, so I'm going to assume by getting something done you mean a good thing, <laughs> a positive reform. Or, or the opposite if that's the case. So just to remind uh, everybody, uh, if you were watching Donald Trump's campaign for president, most people thought that he was focused on unlawful or illegal immigration, focused on border security. And now a large part of his rhetoric was focused on that, but in his position papers and in numerous other situations, he mentioned wanting to put on place new rules for the H-1B, for instance, a requirement that you had to make $100,000 or greater uh, wage to come here on an H-1B. Uh, to put that in perspective, the uh, wages for the 75th percentile of H-1B workers is 81000 So putting on top of that $100,000 minimum wage uh, would do a lot to shrink that program substantially, if not kill it altogether. The knock-on effect of that, because the H-1B is, is a feeder program for the employment-based green card, uh, it could substantially reduce the numbers who get 
uh, employment-based green cards just by that regulatory change in another area. Uh, in terms of all the enforcement stuff, uh, I, I think he's going to do a lot of that, um, increase border security, wall, uh, deport a lot more people, up the deportations. Uh, but in terms of what he wants to do for high-skilled uh, immigration, it doesn't look good. Nothing that he said during his campaign, or at least has been written down in his position papers, is good. Now, sometimes he'll say frequently, you know, one day he'll say H-1Bs, I love them, they're great, they're the best. I can't even do an impression of them. Uh, and then the next day, he'll put out a press release saying, no, they're terrible, they take jobs. And it swings sort of back and forth. Now, I think there's a much higher probability he's going to build a wall and deport millions of people who are illegal immigrants than he shuts down high-skilled immigration. But it's still the highest probability since the early 90s when these things were passed and became law. So we'll see what he wants to do first. Uh, but, I mean, part of the problem I have, um, part of the problem and worry that I have is that it's so uncertain uh, with him. I, I, we were talking about this last night, but if I knew for a fact what he was going to do, I could hedge right now. I could buy insurance. I could change, you know, if I owned a firm, I could buy insurance. I could change my investment strategy. I could change all different types of things. We could start doing it right away. The fact that we don't know what he's going to do and that it could be all over the place is one of the most unsettling and damaging parts of this. Jump on that, even though I, you, you folks elected him democratically, and, and good for you. That's that's the process. Um, for years, it has been very difficult for advocates of cross-border labor mobility to get anything done in the United States because economic mobility, economic migration was so tied up with immigration reform, fears of terrorism, you just could not unpack, you couldn't unravel that ball. If it is possible for President-elect Trump to achieve some of his stated goals on illegal or unwanted immigrants, then that might have more credibility for moving forward on some of the pro-skills uh, migration efforts that we have been working for for, for years. The, the NAFTA visa, the TN visa, has uh, a professions list of occupations that are you know, allowed to cross the border freely, and those occupations haven't been updated since 1994, one or two small exceptions, but there are almost no uh, uh, ICT high-tech jobs listed on there. So it's, it's been frozen since 1994. So maybe tipping over the card table and reshuffling the deck may help to parse, pull apart some of the, the quagmire we've had. Um, if I could add my two cents worth on that one. I agree with both speakers. And I just don't know whether what one says during the election is what one does when they finally get into the office. So with that for a result, also um, often what you do is you put uh, policies in place and other things occur. And uh, it, it's, um, Alex mentioned, uh, you know, Filipino immigrants to the U.S. I was actually in Philippines. I was talking to a group of doctors and they were joking that they're studying to become nurses. And I was, I was so curious, you know, what is that? Well, the immigration policy in the U.S. doesn't necessarily want doctors from Philippines, but would love to have nurses from the Philippines. So the doctors are becoming nurses so they can get. So the reason I bring that is you can put in policies that you want, but the ultimate response of that policy is unpredictable. And then when your president-elect says something that you're not quite sure whether he really means it, and add to that, when he does something, we don't know what's going to happen. So my response, uh, Jerry, is I have no idea. <laughs> it, and, and if I could add just one small thing to that, I was a little negative before, but there's, but there's, yeah, there's, there's two things I want to say though that might uh, increase, uh, update your Bayesian priors to be more positive about this. Uh, one of them is uh, the phrase Nixon goes to China. So if anybody can do it, I think this guy can do it. Of course, the reason why people say Nixon goes to China, because as far as I know, it's happened once. So maybe you know that could be one, uh, one way to do it. Uh, and the other one is there's a large body of uh, literature growing in political psychology called the locus of control. 
And cross-border surveys indicate that when people feel like their government's more in control of immigration, they're more open to it. They want liberalizations. They want to increase the flow of workers, et cetera. And so maybe by building his great, big, beautiful wall and all that other stuff, uh, he will make Americans feel more in control. And by feeling more in control, they'll be much more likely to acquiesce to the other portions of immigration reform. Next question. Well, let me ask one of, of the panel. Um, <clears throat> suppose we get our way. Can you talk about the upsides and the downsides of more open uh, immigration policy? Uh, so I'll start, I guess, with the upsides. Um, we'll have a much, uh, we'll have a faster growing economy. Uh, the amount of uh, workers, the human capital will increase in the United States uh, at virtually all skill levels. We'll see a boost in firm creation. Uh, you'll see a boost probably in internal migration as well as Americans adjust to the increase of uh, migrants coming into the United States. You'll see capital markets adjust if you know your sort of endogenous growth models at all and solo model. You'll see uh, the rest of the economy in terms of the price of capital uh, will rise and as a result uh, the returns on investments in other areas will increase. Uh, and one thing to keep in mind is immigrants don't just, I know we're supposed to talk about the supply side on here, but they don't just increase the supply side, they also increase the demand side by being people who buy the goods and services produced by immigrants as well as other Americans. We have right now, for the products that are made by firms in the United States, by and large an international market for them, um, international price market, international competition. Uh, but now we have a national labor market. We don't have an internationalized labor market. And by, I think, making an internationalized labor market, many more industries in the United States will be far more competitive. Uh, we'll be able to produce far more goods and services at a lower price, uh, which will lower the price for American consumers, as well as the prices uh, for foreigners. And by allowing more of these workers here, we're going to increase the size of the market. Americans at all skill levels are going to be more productive as a result of that. So. Um, it's sort of cliched and it's kind of silly to talk about it in this way, but a growing market and a growing number of people is good uh, for um, the United States and the world. Now, in terms of downsides, um, one of the um, high-skilled immigrants have a uh, very positive impact on the fiscal situation in the United States, on taxes, that they pay more in taxes or more taxes are paid as a result of them being here. Uh, then uh, benefits are consumed. Uh, but in some localities, it's not going to look like that. So in some localities, you're going to have, if you have a surge of people to one area, schooling costs are going to be very high. Uh, costs on the consumption of health care is going to boost up. And there's not going to be a big necessary increase in revenue in those areas. So there might be disproportionate fiscal effects on states or localities due to a liberalized immigration system. So perhaps some sort of federal scheme, because the feds come out ahead almost no matter how you balance it in terms of the tax revenue and expenditures. So some kind of compensation scheme maybe for local or state governments to try to uh, dampen or uh, get rid of uh, these costs. And these costs, by the way, are not just induced by immigrants, but by everybody. I went to public school in California, and I've not paid any taxes there. Uh, so I don't think the Fed should compensate California for that. Uh, but in terms of immigration, some of these other uh, forms of compensation might be necessary. I, I think we've got so fixated on the, uh, the visa issue and the permission to enter a new country that we really haven't thought through the full implications of globalization of people. We know what the globalization of production has done and the way that that has reshuffled the deck in terms of winners and losers from that. Um, what would the implications of a globalized movement of, of relatively free movement of people. Um, our, our friends from organized labor would, of course, tell us that we have to very much focus on portability of labor rights to ensure that worker in country A, when he goes to country B or she, has the same, has the same rights, the same recognition. Also, portability of benefits. If I have, if I have contributed to a pension or uh, other, other employment-based program in Canada, will those same things be recognized uh, uh, in the United States. Um, a, a very obvious problem that we have is cross-border recognition of skills and certification. And we heard some of the panelists from the first, uh, first panel talk about this. But if I want to become a welder in uh, Alberta, 
uh, where the Canadian oil sands are, I have to take all sorts of courses and I have to take five years of, uh, of, of training and apprenticeship and skills and certification before I can walk on to a job site. If I want to be a welder in Chicago, I hold up a sign. Voila, you're a welder. So we need to ensure that if we have a, a, a portable mobile workforce that the skills and certifications and testing methods are, are uh, recognized across jurisdictions. In the North American context, a lot of that happens at the state and provincial level, so that's a lot of levels of government to work through. Uh, and finally, retention. Uh, if we do have a truly globalized and mobile workforce, how do we keep them down on the farm when we've got the bright lights of uh, Silicon Valley in Vegas and Trump Tower to uh, to lure them down south. And, and if I may add in the same light, in the long term, um, if our immigration policy becomes more um, inviting and the rest of the world remains the way it is, I'm hoping that the industries of the future, the um, the biotech cluster, the nanotech culture, the robotic culture will grow much more rapidly here than in other places. So I'm very optimistic in that regard. Um, on just the financial thing, just a side story, um, most of the immigrants are younger. So therefore, if you're old like me and you're looking for social security, your social security will be much more safer. <laughs> Wow, safety in old age through immigration. Uh, wonderful thought. Uh, so we're approaching uh, the noon hour. I'd just like to ask the panelists uh, to please give us some uh, final thoughts, uh, starting with Fari. I am highly optimistic that uh, once the next six months or a year goes by, that our president-elect, being more of a businessman, is going to try to resolve some of these things to the, uh, to the benefit of the global economy and the benefit of the U.S. economy, which I think are, is going to be consistent, uh, particularly in the STEM area, science, technology, engineering, management. Despite the rhetoric during the election process, um, I think when push comes to shove, we're going to see a much more um, even-handed approach to STEM immigration policy. So. Uh, Despite the rhetoric, I think that looking two years down the road, uh, our immigration policy would be much more receptive to the needs of the economy. Um, Canada has a front row seat on the United States. A few weeks ago, Canada, some Canadians put together a video tribute. Hey, United States, you're already great. I wish that the United States could see, Americans could see themselves as the world sees them. Uh, it's a nation of innovation and boldness and diversity and creativity and free enterprise and anybody can make it. You know, the, the, uh, the Statue of Liberty, the, the promise uh, of this great country. And what we see instead, especially in the immigration and mobility debate is fear and divisiveness and uh, uh, you know, zero sum. If they come and take our jobs, there'll be no jobs left. Um, so I, I would just hope that in the next four years, uh, Americans can find their way to see themselves as the great nation of opportunity that they are. Uh, I think it's fairly obvious that voluntary exchanges, even if somebody involved in that is born in a foreign country, are mutually beneficial and wealth creating, especially if they come here to work in the United States. Our immigration system is designed with the assumption that the entire world wants to come here and that they need to be stopped. Uh, now that the entire world does not want to come here anymore, um, it looks like it has um, stopped far more than they intended it to stop. One of the provisions of the H-1B law written in 1991 is that in order to show that you wanted to hire a foreign skilled worker through this visa, you had to attest or uh, make an attestation that you couldn't find Americans to do this. Now that doesn't mean you have to prove it as intensely as you do with other areas, but you have to show some evidence uh, that you can or that it's very difficult. In the debate in Congress in 1990, they talked about this. They thought, do we want to make this a higher burden? Do we want to force employers to show that they absolutely, there are no Americans who are able to do this job before you bring in a worker? In the debate, if you read it, they settled on no, we don't want to do that because the 
cost of being wrong on that, of delaying or not issuing a visa to a firm to the economy is uh, very high for a high-skilled worker. Uh, wages are based on the productivity of the worker. They're not chosen randomly. Uh, so if you have a high-skilled worker who could make $60,000 in the United States and you deny that visa because of a regulatory process, that's $60,000 in lost production uh, to the U.S. economy uh, at a minimum. That doesn't account for other spill-on effects. So if we think about reforming these visas, if we think about changing these rules, which will be on the table, we need to keep that into account to make sure um, that they, people and policymakers actually understand the costs of making some of these changes that they talk about making.